welcome to uh, the Cthulhu panel as part of Digital Tabletop Fest. Um, this is a panel actually I really wanted to do as part of this event, so I'm extremely proud and pleased to be able to present you an illustrious series of guests who are incredibly qualified to talk about Cthulhu, Lovecraft and gaming. Uh, and so uh, myself, my name is Thomas Rawlings. Uh, I run Auroc Digital. I've designed a, a few Cthulhu games, including, including Act on Cthulhu Tactics, Call of Cthulhu The Wasted Land. But I am delighted to be joined by my guests who I'll, 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 I'll poke and they shall introduce themselves much better than I can. So, uh, uh, Sandy, if you'd like to introduce yourself for, every, for the few people who don't know who you are. Hi, I'm Sandy Peterson. Uh, I did the very first Lovecraft game back in 1980, uh, the Call of Cthulhu role-playing game. Uh, I now run my own uh, eponymic game company, Peterson Games, doing tabletop, board, and role-playing materials. Thank you. Uh, and uh, Pia, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Yes. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Pia Jacquemart. Uh, I'm a lead narrative designer at Cyanid Studio near Paris. And I worked on the last Call of Cthulhu video game that was to uh, that was out back in uh, 2018 as a lead narrative designer. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, and Chris Spivey. Hello, everyone. My name is Chris Spivey. I run Darkery Studios. I am the vice president of the Game Manufacturer Association. I'm probably best known for the creation of Harlem Bound that won three gold NEs a few years ago, and I'm excited to be here. Congratulations on those. Uh, I should say we have two Chris's on the panel, which is why some people get their surname and other people don't, for those listening. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, Dan, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Dan Ackerman. Uh, I'm a uh, writer and editor. I do a lot of tech and game reviews at CNET. I've also uh, written books about games, and I finally moved into designing games, which is why I'm so excited to be here with all these great people. Uh, thank you. And last but certainly not least, uh, Chris Lackey. Hi, I'm Chris Lackey. I am the co-host of the HP Lovecraft Literary Podcast at hppodcraft.com. And we've been on for about 10 years now, almost 11. And we talk about weird fiction uh, stories from all different authors, not just Lovecraft. Lots of interesting, silly conversations about literature. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Well, I think first off the topic that I, I think we need to get into, it's 2020. Uh, Lovecraft, Lovecraft Country is on TV. I think if we talked about uh, Lovecraft and his work and we didn't address really the question of his, uh, you know, his various isms, including his very prominent racism, I think that would be the shog off in the room that we avoided. And I think we need to take that on. So, you know, I think that, let's start with that, that kind of as a meaty and important topic. Uh, and, and, and Chris, uh, as in Chris Spivey, I think it'd be great if you could kind of open up that because uh, I got a copy of your Harlem Unbound, which is brilliant, by the way. And you really do tackle this point like full on in there. Uh, you know, what did you say to people who've, who've not read it? And, and, you know, why did you want to say that? Um, other than I would say you should buy the book, I will say that Holman Bound itself, my, one of my primary goals was to address the racism that was inherent in Lovecraft's work and attempt to separate the two because there are so many great ideas that we can take and rebuild to make a more inclusive environment. But you have to acknowledge the fact and the truth that Lovecraft was an ardent racist who was even horrible for his time. And one of the problems that I know that I faced creating the book was trying to approach people that are too busy trying to deny the actual racism in the material and overlook a lot of the other problems or issues with it. No, that's a, that's a strong start. And, you know, what have you found in, in being quite upfront about that as you've discussed it? You know, have you had like, people echoing that, people interested to hear that take, or people pushing back, or, or, or all of those? I've sort of had a mix of all of it, because I've had to not only deal with the some of the fans that were racist or didn't want to hear it, I also had to deal with the publishers who potentially didn't want to hear it. As I shopped Harlem Bound around for maybe three or four years before I published it myself, all I ever heard from multiple publishers was that no one would want to read this or engage with this material. So it's something that you have to learn to decide if you really if you're ready to take it on and in the book i provide you a couple of different vehicles in which you can use to address it for different tiers that would be comfortable for your own gaming group to talk about one of the hard truths of the book itself is that you don't play down racism because there are too many people who have suffered and died from it 
and you don't trivialize it. And you have to understand that the mythos itself, even how it's written in the book, is more of an unknowable, uncaring entity that people choose to use for their own tribes and goals. And it's the people themselves that are the greater horror than the mythos. That was great. And, and Chris, uh, Chris Lackey, I know, yeah, as a long time listener of your podcast for many years now, I know you've you've addressed this topic also head on in the podcast. I mean, how have you how have you and uh, your co-hosts sort of taken this on? Yeah, well, I, I obviously don't deny it. It's there. It's really there. He was very racist. I mean, everything Chris said is totally on the money. Uh, the reason that we're able to still focus on his work is because he did write a lot of great stuff. I mean, I unfortunately people that do great things are flawed. And there are lots of great artists that I love their work, and yet they are uh, terribly flawed people. And you have to figure out what's good about it and take the good from it and point out the bad, point out what's wrong with it and try and learn from it. Um, and, and Pierre, I, I'd be great to hear your, your views on this because I mean, Lovecraft was not only a, you know, a, a racist, but he was, an anti-Semite, and on top of that, he was also a bit sexist. Uh, but I, you know, on your take on the Call of Cthulhu uh, game from 2018, uh, there's a number of really strong female characters in that, and it, it seems, you know, really good characters that that you brought forward in that. Was was that kind of your intention, or is that just how it flowed when you wrote it? So I think there are two things. The first thing is about uh, loving some artists who are flawed. I really think that. Nowadays, there are so many good artists, good writers, etc., that we don't really need to continue worshiping the ones that were bad. So, what helped me in my work when I arrived on the team is that the role-playing game did exist, and even if everything Lovecraft wrote is rooted in his uh, fear of the unknown, which is everyone who is not Wasp. We could also use the, the tabletop RPG to say, okay, we want this heritage, we don't really want to keep it. But there is a deep, there's something we didn't address, is that in the video game, everyone is so white. So I arrived in 2016 and the game was uh, nearly finished. So they told me. So I was here for three months uh, as a freelancer part-time just to finish the game. And so four years later, I'm still at the studio <laughs> and I'm not a freelancer at all because of course we remade the game uh, twice when I was here. So all the characters were done and we didn't have um, any more uh, character artists to change them. So what I chose to do, and it is a bad decision, uh, I decided to address the sexism and I didn't address the racism. So it's not like we are, uh, how to say that, we don't let characters say uh, racist things like, oh, this is bad, we want to address it in a bad way. It's just we totally removed it from the game. And I really feel like uh, it's something that is very uh, not brave, uh, not clever, uh, not good as a human being. And to be fair with you, when the game was out in France and all over the world, I was ready for a shitstorm and we didn't have any. And I was so fucking disappointed in humankind to not say to us, Boo, everyone is white in it. And it was awful because Le Monde, which is a very big French newspaper, called me uh, to to interview me about the game and they were so I don't know not facing it I was the one telling them okay I'm in the middle of this promotional time so I just got my contract I'm not the one who's going to fire the game in the knee you should talk about it so on the sexism, uh, however, it was quite easy because uh, some of the cinematics were already done. Some we could change. So I took all the characters. So we have three main female characters, the woman who's dead, the woman who's a sexy thief, and the woman who's a kind-hearted doctor. <laughs> It was a bit problematic too, and I changed them. I tweaked them. So 
Kat Baker, who is the, the thief. She used to be a man's uh, right hand. We changed it. Now she's the boss. Uh, the nice nurse, she became a doctor and she became, um, there's a big twist. Uh, and also uh, the dead heroine who was supposed to be a love interest is not a love interest anymore. And I have to, to say that I love my coworker and Cthulhu was a wide ride, but it was such a fight to change how the female characters were um, treated in the game, in the story. Um, I used to say I kind of like Call of Cthulhu as uh, a playing world, somewhere, somewhat to, to play with my friends. Uh, I very humbly uh, master some uh, uh, role-playing nights. Uh, I have, so I would say it because I want to be honest with you. I'm always a bit worried when I meet someone who likes <laughs> Lovecraft. I mean, uh, Sandy, Dan, I don't know if uh, you've had any thoughts on, on, on what, what's coming. I mean, Sandy, you've been, you know, doing I have it nothing to add. a long time. <clears throat> I mean, I'll say that um, it's really... It, now that we are, are able to address the terribleness of Lovecraft the person uh, more openly, we, it almost makes a lot of it more relevant now because I started thinking about this maybe a year or so ago. Um, why does Lovecraft kind of seep into the popular culture every couple of decades? It, it must align with something that's happening in society and this concept of a hidden cabal of powerful people and outsiders and others who are threatening you regular Joe who just wants to keep your sanity. Uh, that's the original QAnon, uh, the parallels between our conspiracy theory culture today that is just so poisonous and, uh, and, and the ideas of the mythos and Lovecraft's hive and in the 60s back when it started to become popular again, you had a lot of uh, uh, conspiracy theory as well um, and, and just a lot of um, uh, you know, people who embrace that uh, as a parallel to what's going on in their lives is is why we're why it's so relevant again right now. And I loved books like I mean I read Lovecraft Country when that first came out, uh, and and that was I'm so I'm so excited to see it on on TV now done even better. Or books like The Bow to Black Tom, uh, I think we're all using that mythos in a way that uh, recontextualizes it um, and and uses uh, it in a good way rather than you know in in its more original negative context. Yeah, because I think when I, you know, when I first came and got into it a bit, um, there was this kind of concept of I, I saw sort of put around of Lovecraft is almost like this this open source idea. Oh, sorry, Chris, um, did you, you want to jump in onto that? A little bit. Um, I think having dealt with the the Lovecraft issue for a long time, as I first read, I think Lovecraft when I was around thirteen or fourteen, and discovered the racism when I was fifteen. Um, part of the problem is that people aren't willing, well, at least publishers aren't willing to address it or speak to the matter themselves or make changes in their own products to reflect just common decency, much less appealing to a new revenue stream if they want to think more business savvy about it, which I know like my own struggles with it has constantly been, even when I put out Hardman Bound, I have now more or less been targeted by certain publishers and I have a harder time attempting to create products because I'm trying to bring actual truth of history into things. And so I would really hope that anyone that has any sort of long standing publishing standards or has worked in the mythos for any period of time would actually have a comment they would wanna say about addressing this because it's the fans out there that's reading their materials for decades that we need to change and help address. And I don't mean like saying that, well, racism is bad. It's acknowledging that Lovecraft is racist, material that he's created is racist, and we're trying to make a game for everyone that they can't play, but we can't do that for everyone until we have safe spaces. And creating those safe spaces is an acknowledgement of the people in power to drag everyone along with them to create these spaces for everyone. Because Yeah, the, the, oh, yeah. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I think it's very important. And uh, I really feel like the publishers, they believe that if they address it, if they address it, sorry, it, uh, maybe their core um, buyers won't come back. 
And yeah. I really think it's a big mistake because uh, uh, every modern pop culture product uh, nowadays uh, is a bit uh, filled with some of Lovecraft's not bad <laughs> ideas. So you, you, you can really talk to everyone. And this, this safe space uh, discussion is very important. I really believe that uh, as long as the creators are not safe to express their beliefs, their, what they believe, what they think is good or not, we can't have the good products and we can't appeal to the good people. Because this made me think, Sandy, when we, we did the interview with you the other day, you made something really interesting about the Call of Cthulhu as it's played in Japan, about how, because of the, I guess, for whatever reasons there, the, the Call of Cthulhu role-playing game had become much bigger than Dungeons and Dragons, if I understand right, uh, if I remember rightly. And that had changed the whole culture of role-playing games. It, well, it, I mean, I don't think it so much became bigger. I think it, it started off as the, the early role-playing game and it, it just stayed bigger. I mean, it's it's huge, right? In Japan, I was I didn't realize how big it was. People would tell me that, and I would like, yeah, sure, of course it is. But big in Japan, it's like a joke, right? But uh, when I went to Japan, it was it was the biggest role playing game in Japan, and it's primarily played by women. The, at the convention, the majority of people that were there were women. Um, the uh, uh, the developers were women. The gamers were women. It was like the it was like the complete opposite of what you see at a uh, American game convention. And was the material they were creating different as a result? I mean, I don't know. It's all in Japanese. <laughs> I mean, how how would I tell? <laughs> it, it's really interesting. It's not surprising to me, but it's interesting and gratifying that this is definitely going to be. It's probably the longest section of this panel because it's the most relevant and immediately the thing everyone wants to talk about right now. I'm curious, uh, as a question to the people who are more full-time in the gaming industry than I am, um, I, I, I know in general pop culture, uh, now I feel this is pretty widely accepted and shows like Lovecraft Country really, you know, people go, yes, I, I've seen all this stuff and wow, this backstory I didn't know about, I'm really accepting of this. Is there, do you guys see a change within uh, the games industry uh, separate from the larger pop culture industry where where I think people are, are their eyes are open and they understand. I, I suppose I can speak to that a little as someone in the video games industry now. It's 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 kind of yes and no, which is a, a slight, sounds like I'm avoiding the question, but actually you, you can see, so uh, you can see examples of where um, people talk to stuff, you know, because you get that thing where games can be very political. And then, you know, there's a whole argument. I don't want politics in my games, which, of course, is an omission. I just don't want politics I don't have to think about in my games because by their very nature, it's kind of encoded into it. Um, so, so we see that, like, you know, for example, we, we did uh, when we did Act on Cthulhu Tactics, um, you know, in that game, you kill the Nazis. And uh, it's absolutely the design of the game is you kill the Nazis. And, and somebody had put a comment about, well, can I not play the Nazis? And it's like, no, the absolute intention of that game is that you kill the Nazis and they're allied with these mythos creatures who care nothing about humanity, that's why they're allied with the Nazis. You know, it's it's kind of where it goes. Um, and I kind of wanted to really lean into that in talking about the game more, but but there was, you know, that that was a harder ask, because I guess some people, you know, the, the dang, I think the danger they saw is the game gets tagged as political, but I think ultimately as a creator, you kind of have to do what you feel you need to do to do that. The, the, the difficult thing I, I think often is there's lots of people thinking that certain things will or won't work but often there's a degree of conjecture in there and not necessarily we, we know that to be the case i think what i would say in the video game stuff is things are like you shouldn't do that right up until the point where somebody does it and it's shown to be successful to do it and then it's like of course we're going to do that all the way along um you know it, it's you know the, the industry is difficult but the other thing i, I haven't been in this industry well i think a lot of the time you game development budgets are always squeezed you're always again up against the clock you're always up against pressure and you talked about this little peer in you know arriving partway through a project it, it, it's harder to affect change within a large project than you might think you know th these things kind of like a like a ship they have a degree of momentum of their own and so changing course in it, it is hard that said if people are, you know at, at the top of these large companies do want to see change happen then they can allow the resources to make that happen, which is a kind of roundabout way of saying you're seeing it in some areas and not in other areas. 
so I, I think there is a change going on but there's also as with any change there's a kind of resistance to that change and there's a pressure for more of that change uh, and you i kind of see all, all those patterns of it within there yeah about that i can't wait uh, to see how uh, wizard of the coast will address the systemic uh, racism in dungeons and dragons uh, we have seen a lot of uh, press issues about that lately, how you can uh, create a system of character creation that won't be uh, like orcs or oh, black orcs are worse. And I think it's very interesting. I can't wait to see how you can manage to do that because uh, well, it's just what I believe. Fantasy is so racist. I want to see, I don't know, I want to see Dr. Black Orcs and uh, Free Fighters, Goblins, if it can happen. I, well, I, I think... I would just yeah, the, the interesting thing to come in this that seems to me that that has definitely happened, certainly within Lovecraftian stuff, is this idea that there is no longer a, a gatekeeper of what Lovecraftian should or shouldn't be. Like, I see so many variations and takes on Lovecraft's work, but it seems to me like actually it is, a, uh, I was going to say, this slightly more open sourcey thing. There's a bunch of ideas in the box and people are free to, well, should be free to pick up the ideas that they think are interesting and take them in ways that are relevant to them and, and therefore new audiences to them. I mean, you know, that, that, that's how it seems to me anyway, to a degree. Chris? Um, before we go too far, I do want to go back at least one step and say that everything is political. Even your choice of not including politics in your game is a political move. I know, for instance, I'm going to go back to the, the Cthulhu part of it. A lot of the original games that were put out by companies that were making Cthulhu actively avoided addressing racism in the game. They would say some, even if it was brought up, it'd say, well, it's kind of bad. And then they would lean into horrible stereotypes in their different adventures and scenarios. Cause those were like some of the first ones I encountered when I started playing. And to not, and to see them not wanting to take the steps necessary to correct that is painful at best, but then to see them willing to profit on it continuously. I know I saw even a Kickstarter in 2019 that did something very similar to stuff that was done in the 70s and 80s that was atrocious. I feel like you almost can't, like you can't make a Western today movie or anything that's not um, ironic or meta in some way. I can't see anyone doing the Lovecraft project going forward and anyone sane who does not, who does not make this the core of it. Um, I'm curious the other panelists, if, if you guys, you know, feel like feel like people will will get that, and and future games are are going to be more meta and about Lovecraft as you know a topic itself rather than just using the monsters in just a regular old yeah like you said a game you could have seen in the eighties or nineties. What I've seen them continuously try to do now is they'll try to throw in a splash of color, so they might have like one marginalized person on the cover, and they might have that person being killed. And then everyone else in the book is primarily white cis male doing all the heroic things or they're saving marginalized folks. And it's never, it's usually not anything else but that. And that's how they sort of reinforce that narrative but at the same time by saying that, look, we're inclusive. We may be diminishing your inclusiveness, but you're still here, be glad. Uh, I just want to add, Chris, that, you know, that we are the first ones who will die in this story. <laughs> 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 That's just two of us. Yeah, that's something I feel a lot. Too. In that movie. Yeah. And so I also teach narrative design to not kids. They are 20. They feel like they are not kids. And uh, what I always say to them is that game mechanics are political. So people will often mistake me with a writer, like I love words, I love to write. But in a video game, that's not really what I do. What I do is to make sure that what you do in the game is consistent with what is the main story of the game. And the main story of the game is not the story we wrote with all, all our love. The main story of the game is the story uh, the player creates in his head. So I want to say that if you create a video game uh, in, for example, uh, you arrive on a new island and it's full of uh, drug smugglers, but what you do in this island is to discover new places. Uh, be sure to understand the patterns of the people who are inhabiting this place, to kill them, to put a beautiful flag with your head in it, and then to kill animals, to be more powerful and to continue like that. 
this is what I call a post-colonialist video game. And there's a lot of very big, 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 big uh, video game companies who create these kind of games and who tell us we are not doing political games. But the core of it, the core of what you do is political. And it's really important to acknowledge that. It's okay. Sometimes I want to fantasize about having a big gun and killing people who are not looking like me. And if they be blue and they, if they have tentacles, I think it's better for me to do it, but it's the truth. It's what we are doing as creators and we have to eat, we have to pay the rent. So we still work with these companies and there's good and bad, but everything you do is political. And when you give me your not political bullshit, I don't get it. And because I wanted to tell you something that I walked and uh, never and it's never done nothing. It's completely forgotten kind of uh, follow up for the Call of Cthulhu video game. And there is something that's good. So we they didn't accept it. So I can talk about it. So what I liked in Lovecraft and what I think that people should talk more about is the fact that he has this idea that sanity doesn't exist. And I have to, to say that in the role-playing game, that's what I like the most, playing with crazy NPCs, um, encouraging players to feel like they are crazy. And I think there's a beauty if there's in this um, loss of sanity. And I really believe that sanity is something that was created by capitalism to make you buy antidepressors and go to psychologists. I really think that sanity doesn't exist and that's something that I love in Lovecraft. So I just wanted to give you an idea if you want to work with because we totally failed with the sanity system in Call of Cthulhu, which is my, my favorite part of well, that, the that's, strategy. Sorry, yeah, so then that, you know, with the original, oh, sorry, my friend. Um, yeah, with, with the original um, Call of Cthulhu role-playing game, when I first came across that as a kid, the thing that leapt out to me is is that sanity system, but the, but also that idea of the complete vulnerability. Because prior to that, I just played Dungeons and Dragons, and you know characters could be quite powerful in that. But that vulnerability you had in it, like things felt really stacked against you in a way that the the you know other systems I played hadn't. I mean, was that Sandy when you created that? Was that your intention? Was to make the player feel like you know that they were on the they were on the small end of the of the scale of what power they had? Uh. Call of Cthulhu was a very contrarian game, um, and part of it was that I didn't want the players to. Be, other games generally had people that you were an you were an elite, you were special, you had magic powers, you were a, or whatever you had, and um, and so I wanted to have a game where you were someone ordinary, ish, you know, a regular guy, and that if anything you were worse off than the average person. And so, yeah, the sanity is, is part of that. You're, because of the effects of sanity, um, your life is, is tougher because, you know, you know the awful truth that will destroy the world and it's your burden. At the end of an adventure, you come out of it weaker instead of stronger. When you get a treasure, it's something that you're kind of sad that you have because it's, you know, a moldy old book that makes you go crazy. Um, the, the whole game is designed... It, a normal role-playing game, you go and you fight and you get loot and you get stronger and you fight and you get loot and you get stronger. And that's the cycle that drives people playing it and you don't have that cycle in Call of Cthulhu, all that. And I think that that's part of what led to its popularity because if you wanted to play the regular game where you're a special person and you fight and you get stronger and everything's cool, then every other game literally out there lets you do that. But if you wanted to play a game where you are alone against the awful menaces, Call of Cthulhu was it. You know, so... Well, Insanity I, was part of the reason that made you worse off, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it seems to me the Call of Cthulhu RPG is, is a pretty influential, it's a very influential RPG in terms of gaming. Like so many people I know in the games industry, for example, have played it or know of it or came across it. I mean, you know, why, why, and this, you know, I widen this out to the panel, why are we talking about Cthulhu creatures so many years after, you know, uh, they were created? What What is the intrinsic interest in making a Cthulhu mythos thing, you know, what, what do you feel it is, Sandy? What, what do you feel that people still want to make mythos-y things, uh, whatever take they've got on it, so many years later? Well, I would say it's tough for me to verbalize because I became a Lovecraft, 
craft fan when I was eight years old. That was uh, so, and then from then on, I was a fan. So can I verbalize what I felt when I was eight? You know, he hooked me somehow. I think it's because he was different from every other writer I'd read. Um, the things he, he made me think about, the ideas he, he uh, portrayed were not things I'd encountered. And uh, I mean, you have, you have the story of the Call of Cthulhu, which he has a creature that literally is the poison pill for the whole planet. You have uh, the Shadow of Rinsmith, where it, everyone in the town is a monster. There's all kinds of uh, incredible ideas that were not done uh, uh, on broad a fashion as anyone else. Um, and Chris Lackey, uh, you know, you, you've you've been doing a podcast for nigh on a decade now uh, about, uh, you know, what, what, what's kept you coming back for more? Although, uh, as you said, you've, you've gone from, you know, Lovecraft to Lovecraft. Well, I mean, I, I think like a lot of people my age, I came to Lovecraft via the role playing game. I was a role player and I, I've. A friend of mine who was, uh, you know, played D&D &D and Marvel superheroes and all these games that were out at the early 80s, he said, have you played this Call of Cthulhu thing? And I'm like, I don't, never even heard, what is that? And he goes, oh, it's based on the stuff by H.P. Lovecraft. And I said, who's that? And he said, oh, well, and he gave me a copy of one of those Del Rey books. And what I think is why Lovecraft is so... Um, sticky why people just it, it's just part of the zeitgeist is that there's that the cosmicism it's this idea i was raised christian um, and so i had this idea of like you know there's a benevolent thing out there that's protecting everybody and everything's going to work out everybody's going to get what they deserve eventually so at some point in life or, or in the afterlife and then i get this this stuff from lovecraft and he's like oh no there is no benevolent guy. In fact, there's just malevolent things out there. It, the best case scenario is you're just going to die peacefully, an old person. Uh, worst case scenario is you'll be driven mad. You'll you'll understand how the universe really works, the truth of things, because the truths are horrible. And I think that that's why Lovecraft is still around. That those those ideas that the truth is horrible. Like the more you learn about what's going on, the more you learn about your your culture, your world, your society the the cosmos it's it's frightening it's it's horrific it's not this beautiful thing that we have um kind of in the backs of our our minds and as a society and i think maybe that's why parts of uh like lovecraft country that's coming out there's it's showing us that it's showing us that oh no things aren't great things are are horrible and they've been horrible for a long time and they're probably just going to keep getting more and more horrible and that's uh you know that's scary that's scary to to everybody because i think we all try to find safety in our lives and we find comfort and uh that that's what that it's the dichotomy of wanting to know the truth and know what's real and what's going on and protecting yourself from the truth and i think that's like why lovecraft is stuck around as long as he has and down with techlandia i mean why 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 uh, kind of a Lovecraftian sort of bent on the game there. What, why, you know, what, what, what made you feel that was the right me mesh for what you were working on? I mean, so much of, of what people take as Lovecraftian is really uh, secret societies and political and social elites and power structures. Um, what better example of that today is there than these gigantic tech and social media companies? Uh, that are in many ways like like multi tentacled monsters um, that control so much of our lives from from behind the scenes. Even even the way your profile and your data is used without your you know knowledge or permission. Um, but I think that the it, it also goes towards one of the key things that I think a lot of people miss about Lovecraftian ideas, which is that especially how they're used. Uh, in a more modern sense, it's, it's less about the monsters and more about the people acting on behalf of those monsters, uh, whether it's the you know, employees at the uh, social media company or it's the CEO of the big tech company. Um, you know, that's, not, that's the modern version of all this wrapped up in conspiracy theories and, 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 and scapegoating. And the modern version of that, of course, is this awful QAnon stuff, um, which, which was not my... Uh, top of mind when I was working on this game over the past, you know, two plus years. But as it went along, all these opportunities presented themselves uh, to me. Uh, much as when you're writing a book, 
the char- you know, the characters and, and the and the things in the book take on a life of their own and suggest their own connections. And the more I went down this path, which started with just a bad experience I had at a big tech company press conference that seemed particularly hellish and I wanted to escape from, which might be something you would do in a game, it <clears> just got bigger <throat> and changed into something that's much more about uh, the power structures of, of these giant companies and the and the people who lead them. And Sandy and I had a quick chat before this started, and he made a suggestion that I had not thought of. And now I, I'm, I'm going to retroactively say that, oh, this was always a part of it. Uh, behind, let's say, Apple, you have a, a charismatic, very powerful leader there. But behind him is a deceased founder uh, leader who is even more of a legendary figure and who still permeates um, what's happening there today among, you know, in the most powerful, most valuable corporate entity on the planet. Um, and, and, and Chris, uh, for Harlem and Bound, I mean, what, what, what attracted you to using a Lovecraftian set for the story that you wanted to tell there through the game? Well, one of the main things was the, at Har- the Harlem Renaissance itself was an incredible period that helped shape the world. And so few people know about it or even acknowledge its existence. And given the fact it dovetailed perfectly with the 20s, which was one of the key Lovecraft periods, and my cousin is Ornell Hurston. They just sort of all rolled into one and gave me the extra momentum to make sure that I could represent black excellence and tell a mythos based story and address the issues of Lovecraft in a way that I have not seen anyone else do in the TTRPG sphere. And um, from like a lot of the stuff we've talked about so far, it's kind of like there's people involved in it. One of the things I found interesting about Cthulhu Wars, uh, your most recent, Cthulhu, well, one of your more recent Cthulhu games, Sandy, is that it struck me as almost like a, a post-human world, like as if all the people had lost in all the other Call of Cthulhu adventures, people are basically gone gone now, the old ones are back. Did you in, intend it to be like that? It's like a Call of Cthulhu game where all the players have lost. Well, I mean, it obviously is that. Uh, I, uh, as far as being post-human, I'd like to point out that the majority of the characters in every faction are human. They're cultists, because the cultists have won. Um, but yeah, I was always interested in the idea of uh, what happens after Cthulhu comes back. Because in the game Call of Cthulhu, or most games, the game ends when Cthulhu rises. Either you defeat him and he doesn't rise, or he rises and you don't go any further after that. But I wanted to kind of see him with all his toys, with mountains of protoplasm rising from the deep with uh, <clears throat> telepathy blanketing the land, with everything that humans cared about, politics, race, art, everything we had becoming meaningless because now Cthulhu's here and it's all over. And uh, and I actually used to run, periodically I would run a, a Call of Cthulhu tabletop RPG set in like that post-Holocaust environment. And um, the, the Cthulhu Wars game evolved partly out of that and partly out of my desire to do what I thought was going to be my very last original uh, product. And I wanted it to be the ultimate Cthulhu game. So. Well, what? Yeah. I'm going to quote for 2020 that the cultists have won. Well, I mean, you start with cultists on the map only, right? So even if there's other humans, which there presumably are, they're, they're not relevant. I mean, that's the world we're living in right now. You could say that about this year. We, we yeah, there's certainly oh. more cultists around oh, in the world. But uh, it's, uh... and and Pierre, in in the Call of Cthulhu uh, game that you you worked on, you said I was going to ask you kind of like how did you know the the kind of overall structure of that game sort of come about? But you said you joined partway through the team, so you you were you not there at the beginning of that and kind of came in later in the in the development cycle? Actually, we the only thing that we kept. Uh, where are the 3D models and some of the maps. But uh, yeah, I did all the structure of the game. So you can ask me any question, I even, I did it. Yeah, I was gonna, because uh, the ending I thought was really good, which I don't want to say, because it's well worth people playing it and experiencing the ending for themselves. Um, we have you know, well, you see, I, I knew there were multiple, but I didn't want to say that either, because I thought if I say there are multiple endings, then that sort of implies- you know, Okay, let's, let's yeah. do you have the one with the- Oh, yeah. do you have the one with the? Oh no, that. Yeah. That, that, that one you have. That one. That's the best one. Yeah, it was supposed to be so hopeful, so 
piggy 18 that everyone stopped me. Like they were cultists having white sex and it was a bit complicated. <laughs> so you don't have cultists having white sex at the end of Love Clock City video game. But yeah, yeah, it was, a, it was, so you, what you want to know about the structure, how it works, how you get to one of the ends? Well, I was more thinking why, why you took that approach because it's much more narrative narrative based game than other sort of Cthulhu video games I've seen, which tend to have a bit more combat in where you're just shooting people, whatever. In, in this one, it seemed to be much more about the story. What can I tell you? Do you want the rude truth? <laughs> um, it was meant to be a narrative slash RPG video game. The thing is, it's always about money. So when I arrived on board, it was supposed to be a more RPG slash investigation, but it's extremely expensive. And uh, we are all uh, of Octulus players, so you know that all the skills are so different that if you want to let the player play the game as he would do with the tabletop RPG, it's going to cost, I don't know, so many millions. We didn't have that money. So what we did is um, we chose some of the skills that will tell the story of a detective. So a detective is already a bit above uh, the normal human being, but we kept it because it was uh, meant to be someone a bit, uh, it, the French, they use badass. They didn't want, I don't know, a normal man. So we had to keep with that. And what we did uh, is that we wrote something that will be a bit uh, literary and quite linear, actually, for, for money questions, for money reasons. That everyone has the same places in the same order and the same cinematics. But what we wanted to give uh, as a flavor is that it's very heavy on uh, branching dialogues, which is my, my favorite part of my work. And uh, the branching dialogues are giving you uh, different informations, different relationship with, uh, with the different NPCs and different ways of solving uh, a situation. So what I call a social key is like when you have this metaphorical gate, you can't go through this part of the game because this lady, she doesn't want to tell you, I don't know, where you must go after that. So you have to talk to her until she gives you the information or until she gives you a clue about how to get this information by yourself. So what you have to do is to choose how you will act. Uh, so what we did uh, is a, a few different things, but first we have three um, detective personas. So it's not written uh, in the game, but it's how it was built. So there is the, the very um, dark detective, like uh, the word is doomed, everyone is a liar, etc. There is also the one who always want to save the damsel in distress. And there is the one a bit more uh, Sherlock Holmes-like, he's a bit more intellectual. So these are some of what I call hub. A hub is a part of a dialogue when you, someone tells you something and then he asks you basically a question, even if it's not written like a question and you have to answer. This is his wall place. Okay, that's a hub. And these hubs, they are here just for the player to express his personality. So whatever he chooses, it doesn't really change what comes after in the dialogue. And then what we did, uh, so we gave it a few times in the game, the possibility to express who you are. It's free, it's just for the flavor. And what we did after that is the main hubs uh, how you will solve this mystery, this problematic. And here you can use the different skills. And uh, depending on the skills you use, you will change relationship, ex uh, experience points, uh, the way uh, which rooms you will see, which objects you will see, which items you will see, and ultimately which end you will have. Uh, because we have a bit of a sanity system and it changes depending on some of your uh, decisions. So it's very, very, um, actually, inside the dialogues, it's very complex because uh, we have this dialogue editor at Cyanide uh, in which you write the dialogue, you choose who is talking to you, you give all the possible options, and then it's in these uh, tools that you can give experiment points, change relationship, uh, uh, what we call uh, tags, so uh, the game can track what you've done. We did it, we do it through this. So we did a lot of things. And for the overall structure, what we decided is 
I really want to talk about that because I think it's interesting is when you adapt a work, you take it from a different era, different time, mm-hmm. and you have to ask yourself, why should I give it to some different people, to some uh, with a new modern take to these people who might not know it? Because the Lovecraft fans, they will get the game, they will love it, they will not love it. It's okay, Trivo. You see, sorry, French. What I wanted to do is what is interesting in Lovecraft's story to play with. So we play with this idea of sanity, of you can't really escape sanity, and we choose something that Lovecraft believed. So it's not what I believe, but it's we 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 felt it would be interesting. Is like everyone is doomed, like you can't escape your fate. And so if you play the game once, you will see that it has a cycle narrative structure, it always goes back to the end of the destiny wheel because every each one of the three acts begins with the sad end that will come in this act. And what you do as a player and what you do as a character is trying to escape that, not leave that, not go to that point, but at the end you always go to that point. And the very beginning of the game turns that so it's so obvious. Uh, the beginning of the game, you are in a cave, uh, yeah. and there is a guy who is uh, killed. And that's what happened at the end of the first yeah. act. So that's how we, we worked. Because the, the, one of the things I found interesting is a, a parallel is the central character you had in that was a war veteran. And reading uh, Harlem Unbound, uh, Chris, you had war veterans as central characters in, in there. I mean, you know, the, uh, and you know, was that a kind of again as you did the research in that period or did you feel like you wanted that that angle to come into it or was was yeah what 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 made you you know also have that kind of first world war putting its shadow into the work you're doing as it's in the Cthulhu the Call of Cthulhu uh, game that Pierre worked on well the war kind of overshadows a lot of that period of itself and being a veteran i wanted to definitely make sure there was veteran representation inside the book and this would also go back to the political piece as a lot of the black veterans when they came back were not didn't receive the same rights and benefits as the white soldiers did. In fact, the Hellfighters themselves were denied awards they should have won. They weren't allowed to be part of the parade that the other soldiers were and they had to have their own in the end. So there's so many different stories that are just tied into that, coupled with the fact that one of the things, because I want to add a little bit of a pulp event to the game itself, is that you automatically have a pulp s character if you have a military trained person coming back from war they've got a skill set that a lot of other investigators don't have to start with um and the the other thing that struck me about it and um it has that real sense of the that this battle over the ages like reading the the kind of background piece you you wrote in the historical thing of, of how it how it flows it really does have that sense that this is almost like an eternal battle that you're just coming in on a bit of it. It goes into showing how uncaring and nearly unstoppable the mythos is. For all of humanity's time, they may have been trying to fight against it, and we may have a brief snippet of a win. We get like a few days where everything is fine, but then it continuously goes on and it crushes those people under it. And the new generation of people stand up, they try to fight, and they're also crushed. And it's that constant struggle for like the briefest instant of hope. And that boils down to like what humanity is. Mm. And 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 Dan, you you talked a little bit about uh, earlier about how that you've been to that press conference and that gave you that sense of, uh, you know, something monstrous behind the normal, as, as Chris just talked about, like it's kind of always there. And, and the thing I found interesting, you're taking something quite mundane of technology that's all around yeah. us, and then saying, oh no, actually, it's all also part of that ongoing battle. Like like we can't escape it anywhere. Yeah, what's the what's the one thing that everyone always has with them all the time and is just you know part of your personnel? Well, it's your phone, uh, and that's why in in Techlandia, uh, where you play as a uh, uh, it, it's 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 very in jokey about you know the tech industry and media and journalism. So you're a heroic tech blogger, uh, and this big company is introducing their new phone, much as Apple or Samsung would do with a big giant event. And of course, as a lowly tech blogger, you were not invited, so you have to sneak in. Uh, as many reporters have snuck into many press events and, and press conferences. But I was fascinated by the idea 
that you are carrying the, this anchor with you, this anchor to other things right now in real life. This, uh, I guess it doesn't really look like a phone because it's in a case, but this is a, you know, of your phone is anchored all, to all these location tracking systems and, 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 and cookies and all kinds of behavioral tracking that, that seeks to suck information out of you and also feed it back to you to influence your behavior. Um, you know, that's the social media model, you know, right there. And it's very tied in, uh, even though you may not think of it this way, with the hardware model, the devices you have. So what if this is the actual evil thing, that phone you carry in your pocket or put next to your brain uh, all the time? I, I started thinking about, you know, as you work through it, I started to think about the rare earth elements uh, that uh, power these phones that are actually only mined in certain areas of China uh, and the and the uh, ways companies twist themselves into into uh, rhetorical knots to try to justify uh, how these rare earth materials are mined. Uh, so you know, there's layer upon layer. And frankly, when when people see Techlandia or play it or or, or talk about it, and unlike some of the other, uh, unlike uh, uh, the Call of Cthulhu. Uh, uh, video game. Uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a physical, it's, it, it's, a, it's a tabletop game. And I wanted to make something just very small and portable that almost is like a phone. You can just take it with you. Uh, people said to me, this sounds too much like real life because except for a few supernatural things that sort of sneak in, it is not really even all that much. At the end of the day, most of the supernatural got filtered out of the game and replaced with real life uh, mm -hmm. things that are just as scary. Uh, yeah. Hey, you want to jump in on, on that point? Well, I have to tell you that you can play this wonderful game on the Switch too, so you can take it I, everywhere I, with you. I'll tell you why I'm always playing Call of Cthulhu, because it is one of the games that I use at CNET as a tech reporter and tester and reviewer to test cloud gaming services. NVIDIA has a cloud gaming service called GeForce Now, and Call of Cthulhu is one of the games on it that I own a license for, so whenever I fire up a device, that is going to be able to use that that cloud gaming service, which is a whole really <clears throat> that's not quite there yet. There, you know, there's still some wrinkles to iron out. It's like you know, Google has Stadia, Amazon's going to have Luna. Call of Cthulhu is like the first game that pops up, so I'm always I'm I'm, I'm, prote I'm perpetually stuck in the third act, <laughs> testing cloud gaming. And, okay, and so Chris, means you need help. <laughs> and Chris, you know, you you've uh, you've been through all of Lovecraft stories on the podcast. Uh, well, two quick questions. What, what have you? What do you feel you learned having read all of Lovecraft stuff over the last decade and a bunch of all the peers, uh, the other people writing fiction around that time? Plus, are you guys going to cover games on the HP podcast as well? <laughs> uh, well, pro probably not. I mean, maybe like as a as a bonus content, we would cover some games and, and things. But it's uh, we're focused on the literature and and that period of history. And there's, it, it's interesting to see how much of uh, Lovecraft stuff comes from other authors. Like he, he wasn't this bound that uh, of just purely unique ideas. I mean, he did come up with some really great stuff, but you can see the seeds from other authors like Arthur Mackin and Algernon Blackwood, uh, Lord Dunsany. These are the guys that really uh, kind of influenced him and gave him these seeds. But I, the one thing that is different, I. I keep harping on it is the cosmicism that Lovecraft had and because those guys didn't really quite nail it like he did and uh, I, I, why he is sticking around as much as much as he still seems to be is because he influenced so many other authors and that's something that doing the podcast we've seen all of these other people from like Robert Block to Stephen King to Clive Barker to any almost all modern authors even if they don't Rod Serling uh, if they read his stuff, they processed it, they incorporated it into their things. And so um, it's it's just part of the, the bedrock of, of horror, maybe perhaps because it is an ultimate horror. And we're in the final bit now, we've, we've got a few minutes left. Uh, and, and I suppose to get a sort of, oh, quick, oh, Pia, did you want to come back on? Yeah, I just have a quick. I just have a question for Chris Pivey because you told something earlier and it bothered me, but not bothered me like. But okay, when you say that what you wrote, so I really want to play your Lovecraft game now. But what you wrote is that do you believe that the mythos is something like is humanity or the, no? I didn't. Maybe I didn't quite get it, but you told me that. You told us that the youngster, the young generations, 
they try to fight for hope, but then they are crushed. And I was feeling that some way the mythos that crushes us is humanity at its worst. Like I made a distinctive difference between what the mythos and what humanity is. Yeah. But for that, I was specifically saying that the mythos is unknowable, almost unstoppable force, and humanity keeps struggling against it. And that struggle in of itself is sort of like our constant struggle for hope, which part of that goes back to the black experience in America, which is a constant struggle of perseverance, regardless of like the crushing weight of racism and everything else we have to endure, we keep struggling, hoping for a better tomorrow. And part of that is represented in Harlem Unbound. And I use the mythos as sort of uh, an example of that. But I make a distinctive point to say that it's human evil that does things, not the mythos making them do it. Yeah, okay, because can we, can we, could we, in a hypothetic story with the Lovecraft in background, consider that the mythos could also be a metaphor of, for example, governments? I'm confused by your question. I'm saying I, that if it's human intention that tried to use the mythos for their own ends. Yeah. I'm not saying that the mythos uses humans. The mythos does its own unknowable thing. But so even I think an example in the book, it says specifically that the clan may attempt to contact Cthulhu to help them crush Eatonville. And Cthulhu may send dreams that aid them, but it's doing it because of its own ends. Cthulhu doesn't care one way or the other about whichever human faction is doing what. So, um, so you're that, really that you did humanity that is driving their own purpose to do what they're going to do. Yeah, so yeah, the uh, anthropomorph, and I don't know how to pronounce it in English. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Anthropomorphic. The, yeah, the fact that the humans they use something that's still bigger than them for their petty human problems, kind of. Yeah, the, the I really. Sorry, I, I like the idea of the mythos being something so bigger <laughs> than us that it's not good or bad. It just, you know, you it's can't a bit. But yeah. also, I feel like we could go. I don't know. Well, someone, I... we could do a very. I don't know. I need to read your story first, and then can we go a bit? Well, we um, are, for anyone that wants to read it, it's Harlem yeah. Bound. This is a first edition book. It has a lot of Lovecraft into it. Look how I did that there. And if you want, there's also the second edition that's now available from Chaosium. Sorry, you Which gave me a chance to pitch myself. Gonna... I had to, as yeah. poor struggling artist, pitch well, myself. We're, yeah, we've, I'm afraid to say we run out of time. It's an absolutely fascinating conversation. And I want to thank all of you for taking part in it and all of you for really, you know, uh, bringing so many interesting strands onto uh, the topic itself. Uh, it's It's been great. The links are to everybody's work is below. Please do check them out. There's so many great works uh, that have been created by the people in this panel. Uh, and, and again, once again, thank you all for your time. I really appreciate it. Okay. Thanks. Thank you.